Hey everyone, and welcome back to The Mystery Theory. Today we're going to have a case a slash events, or I don't even know how to say it, but something that I didn't know it was going on, I realized when I came across this case. For some reason, in my mind, when somebody goes missing and they find a Let's say a girl went missing and they find a Jane Doe. They look into a database and they try to put two and two together to see if that's a person. Well, in some cases, that is the case. <laughs> but in some other ones, it isn't. And I run, a couple, uh, run across a couple of cases where... This case where a father disappeared and the daughters reported the dad as missing. And then the police said, well, he probably just left you guys. And a year later, they find a body of a man and they, I don't know, basically discard him. They, 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 they put him as a, Jane, as a John Doe just to find out. I think 10 years later, by the daughters, that that John Doe, that they were never informed that existed, was actually their dad. And this is thankfully for a project, a website that now it's in, you know, it's in the business of putting two and two together and finding the identities of all the Jane and John Doe's that we have. And let me tell you, we have thousands of them. They're all over the United States, and that's according to the research that I've done. I don't know around all the world, but I know that in the United States, um, different corner offices and morgues and hospitals, they all have this Jane and John Doe's. So there is something that it's being done now to give them a name, to give them an identity. In, in today's case, we're going to do it backwards. We're going to see how a body is found and how it's connected to who she was. It was a roller coaster. It wasn't an easy process, and I'll go through the process with you. But it sent me to know that there's not a connection, and this is according to one of the, you know, the corner offices. Um, he mentioned in an interview that there's not a connection between or there's not a database that the coroner's office can check to see okay this is a guy that is in his 30s he was this and this and that and it match to the description of this missing guy from months ago or years ago there's not a connection and i just had no idea And it's disheartening and it's unbelievable that today with all the amazing evolution that we have in forensic evidence and, you know, DNA and everything, that there's not a connection between those and something it's being done, but it could be a lot better. Now, let me start with today's story and... This took place in Harlan County in Kentucky. Um, I haven't been to Kentucky, even though I know it's beautiful. I watch many documentaries and, you know, those kind of adventure and trails and things, uh, programs that you can see on TV. And I think it's beautiful. It, one of the, the most beautiful places that I've seen, at least on TV, in the area. Their house... I mean, a lot of history, there's a lot of history in the area, and there's a lot of trails and nature and a lot of things that I do enjoy. However, as far as I know, this Harlan County was a coal town that started back as a coal town, quote-unquote coal town, in 1911. Now, <laughs> as most of this industries back in the day, they had a little mm, problem or they started struggling, I should say, in the 90s and the year 2000. So 
it kind of changed today. But just so you have an idea, that's how basically it started. Now, in on June 1st of 1969, um, in Harlan County, of course, the, the there's a beautiful tra- trail that is called Shepherd Trail. And there was this guy that was picking flowers for his wife. And he was walking by that sh- that trail, which, by the way, it's pretty busy for, I mean, it's visited by hunters and hikers. And even back then, it was pretty busy. And I'm talking about back in 1969. Uh, I don't know how it is today, but back then it was a pretty frequented spot. Now, this guy was picking flowers for his wife and he found the body of a young woman. Uh, she was stabbed multiple times in the chest and she was also naked. Now, that's not everything. The autopsy uh, couldn't really reveal who she was. Her face was missing. And according to the description in one of the interviews, it was like the, the center part of the face was missing. And you can see on the sides her skull and... It wasn't a good thing. I mean, she was being eaten by maggots and uh, it was described as a very, it was in a decomposition stage that it was very gruesome. And at the time, they just didn't have every single tool to try to find out uh, who this person was. So... They decided to bury her in a small cemetery on a mountain. Now, I'm telling you, this is a small cemetery. It's tiny. It's very rural-like. It's not, you know, what we know today as a cemetery. And uh, it was kind of for, you know, the locals with a little grave not even stone it was like um, just little things that they would put with the names and some flowers and you know people would decorate it and uh, she had a very small casket and the name and it was an identified girl later on she'll become the mountain unidentified girl so she didn't even have a name when she was buried and it was very shocking for the community Um, at the time they just didn't understand who she was they knew that she wasn't from there because people knew each other in the area and nobody was reported missing at the time and they were also wondering who could have done it because I mean we have to think about that too was it somebody in town Are you living next to a killer? I mean, those are the questions that the people in the community had. Even though if I really, I mean, and this is just me, but if it was somebody from the area, why would a person leave her body in a very used kind of trail? I mean, who would dare to do that if they were from the area? However, that is where the story begins because... (laughs) Who's going to fight for somebody who doesn't even have a name? How are we going to find out who did this to her if we have no idea who she is in the first place? Now, Darla Sailor Jackson, uh, she wrote wrote a book about this mountain girl. Let's call her a mountain girl. And uh, in the book... She also mentioned another similar case. And I guess that she mentioned that with the hopes that it would happen the same. This other girl was identified as Tent Girl. And they discovered her body along uh, US 25 in Scott County. And she was wrapped in a tent canvas thing. And that was in 1968. So it was around the same time. But this case in particular was ultimately solved. And it was solved by a guy who liked to 
do a little true crime on the side. I mean, he liked to research true crime. And he had this passion for trying to find a connection between the Jane and John Doe's and missing people. <laughs> he solved it, the one of Tent Girl. He solved it in 1998, so it took 30 years. But he matched the Jane Doe information with um, a person's case, and that's how he made a connection between them. Now, if you're thinking that this guy was a law enforcement related guy, well, no. He was working in an auto part factory in the area, and he spent a lot of time doing a lot of research in his free time. Um, there was a, this little interview in a documentary that I watched that he said that, you know, they have the trailer um, home, very you know, small, not nothing crazy big or exuberant or anything like that. And he remembers that when he was doing the research for Tent Girl, his wife would be in the room sleeping and he'd be in his little nook doing the research. And that sometimes she would get really mad at him because, you know, he was spending a lot of time doing the research in something that it wasn't even his job. Now, in 1998, when he finally cracked that case and he realized that Tent Girl had a name and made a connection and, you know, he became somewhat of a celebrity. Um, and so it turned into a job. Um, the Department of Justice wanted more from him and it was so much more that it kept him very busy. Now, he was working full-time for the Department of Justice. So, out of a hobby that he had, he became uh, one of the first two people in this field. Let's call it that way. Now, in 1968 and then Mountain Girl 1969, it kind of... Um, would make sense that maybe it was the same person who killed them both. But that's not where we need to start because the beginning is just to find out who is Mountain Girl. Now, according to this guy, and I need to mention this because you're probably wondering why, I mean, is he just a weirdo that was doing this kind of research on the side and why would anybody normal do research on true crime cases? Well, you're listening to one of those weirdos. But uh, he said that he, when he was two years old, um, his sister died. And um, it's funny how you don't think that you'll remember those things. But as you're getting older, you'll start to remember more and more things than when you were two or three years old or four and when you were 10, you couldn't remember really that time. But he remembers the time when he had to go to uh, the funeral of his sister. That, you know, it, it, it's not a body. It's a human being. It's a person that they're laying down. And he could see how everyone was suffering and everyone was sad about it. And now... <laughs> He feels that that was the point when he got interested in the whole trying to give a little bit of peace to families that are looking for the loved ones. He understood how after the funeral of his sister, after being so sad and so depressing and so hard overall for the entire family, they moved forward they couldn't move on because they missed her but they moved forward and it was a sad time that they could somewhat step away from and continue with their lives but he realized that it must be really hard to report somebody missing and never know what happened to them. 
you know, not having a casket, not having a cemetery, not having a body, not having something that they can, it's like they can't move forward. How can you? Your friend disappears, your mom disappears, your dad, your daughter. How can you move forward when you don't know what really happened? So he made it kind of his mission to give that closure to the family. That he knew that he can make it better because they already disappeared. But he can make it better for the idea of giving them that the piece of closure. Now, <laughs> this is a very uh, kind of touchy subject because, you know, I've listened to many, many people that they have kids missing or parents or sisters or brothers or... And again, it's... it's I get what he's saying because... According to one of the research, 80,000 people uh, are missing in the U.S. on any given day. So this is not um, once, you know, every whatever million. No, 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 this is pretty common. So just knowing that there is 80,000 families today that are not grieving, but they're hoping and waiting and doing something every single day to kind of find that person. It's kind of heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking to know that they do not get this closure. Uh, So I completely understand his need. And maybe for you it's a gruesome job to dig bodies and you know, find DNAs and DNA and families that match. It is a gruesome job. But I think that in the end, you're giving that closure to people that otherwise would have never found it because of that missing connection or database between the coroner's office and the authorities. So... In this particular case, going back to Mountain Girl, they had four families that could have had something to do with that missing Mountain Girl, okay, or that dead girl that they found in the in that they put in the cemetery in the mountain. So they had more than enough reasons to dig up her grave and. I understand that for some people that is something that you should never do. But it's something that it's been done to give that peace to the families that are looking, still looking after 30 years, 40 years for those family members. Now, um, the coroner's office, it, 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 I mean, don't get me wrong, this is not a walk in the park kind of thing. It needs to be authorized to be done. So this guy, he had to get all the things in order, in order to dig the grave of Mountain Girl. The reason why they did it in this particular place, or case I should say, is because they believed that, of course, foul play was involved. I mean, she was stabbed to death in her chest. Now, they put away the decorations that strangers put around her grave and they took it as evidence and also for the family once they find it (laughs) this is a daughter a mother and she needs a name she needs somebody somebody's looking for her so they put those things away and uh They thought that they had more than enough good bones, quote-unquote good bones, for DNA testing. It is not a quick process, so it did take them six months to... for the DNA to come back. And when it came back, the reports were devastating. The remains were not 
Mountain Girl's remains. Apparently, the marker of her grave was misplaced. And what they dug up was somebody else's body. So, after six months and all this time invested in money and resources, they realized that it wasn't her. That this body, in as a matter of fact, it was a guy's body. And, uh, I mean... The problem with the markers that they put in this kind of graves at the time, it was like a little stake looking uh, marker that would have the name and the year that she died and the name Unidentified Girl. So when people would mow the lawn or, you know, clean the cemetery, more than likely they moved that marker more than once. And that's why they actually dug up somebody else's body. Now, years later, in November of 2015, the authorities returned and exhumed the body again. But this time they had to dig three graves before they found her. And um, they knew it was her because she was inside a body, a bag. So they were pretty sure that it was hers. Um, It matched the description. So they ended up sending it in to be tested for DNA. They were hopeful and they were 90% sure that this was her body and that it kind of matched the description of everything that they used when they put her there. Now let's move on to one of the families that was believed to be maybe related to Mountain Girl. I'm going to tell you the story and it's going to sound a little bit, I don't know, like a fight. That it shouldn't have happened, but I think it's important to know both sides. Now the family that match one of them... Um, the timeline of a missing girl with the unidentified girl being dead at the time in a nearby county. Um, It was something like this. The girl that disappeared had a daughter and she disappeared in 1969. The family was still looking when in 2007, so I'm talking about The girl had to be raised by her grandparents because of her mom disappearing. Now this girl grew up knowing that her mom disappeared and hoping and praying that the mom would come back one day to get her and take her with her because she thought that she left. But something in her told her otherwise. And in 2007, she saw a news piece talking about this unidentified girl that they found dead in 1969. Now they had a phone number, she called and told them that she thought that was her mom. And um, at the time, they told her, I don't think so. She was a girl, and she couldn't have had kids. So even though she knew in her heart, and she believed that that was her mom, she couldn't do anything about it. So it took until 2014 when she finds the unidentified person system that is called NAMIS. This is an amazing program that actually matches DNA from people or family members that are looking for somebody to Jane and John Doe's. And they keep them in the database so they can connect them even if they don't have anything today. So, NAMIS took DNA from her and her children. It took a couple of times, but it actually worked. And when the taste came back, it revealed that it was, in fact, her mother. The name of Mountain Girl was Sonia K. Blair Adams. She disappeared from her home in Letcher County, Kentucky, which is pretty close to Harlan. And she was 21 years old when she left. And she had a little girl 
Karen. The one that has been calling different programs and trying to find out where her mother was or if they had her mother's body. Um, as you can probably tell, she didn't have that much time with her mom. So she described her mother in an interview that was in this particular documentary saying that she was a good person, kind-hearted, and that people liked her a lot. According to her daughter, she knew all along that that Jane Doe in the mountain that she saw on the TV that night in 2007 was her mom. She had to have a second service um, after they found out that it was in fact Sonia. And the second service was a gift from Darla. Remember the, the one that wrote the book? Well, she owned the funeral home too. So 47 years later, after the, they found the body of Sonia, her daughter, Karen, who missed his mom for those 47 years, and Darla, the writer of the book that started this whole thing. They got together and planned this beautiful service for Karen's mom, or Mountain Girl. There is a little piece in this documentary where she's presented the bones of her mom before they put it in the casket. And it was such a sad moment, because, really, if Darla, I mean, the, 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 the book writer, didn't put the effort into writing the book, you know, like the butterfly effect that we were talking the other day, the Monday video, I'll we'll have a link up there if you want to check it out, but it's almost like the, the butterfly effect, you know? She didn't know who this girl was, but she took interest in it. She wrote a book. The book was read by a guy that happened to do this kind of thing. To dig up graves and find their families. What are the chances, really, that somebody with the power to do something about it reads a book that you wrote about with the hopes that something new, somebody knew something. Well, they didn't. But it was much better. I mean, it couldn't have worked in a better way. But can you see how a series of events had to happen in order for Sonia to have her name in her grave that she deserves? Everyone deserves that. So this case, I mean, you know, I, 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 I was watching the last part of the documentary where the daughter was saying that she wished that she could know, you know, that it's not done until she can find whoever killed her mother. So, yeah, she did find the peace to know that, you know, her mom is there. She could grieve her. She could cry. She could... But she can move forward but at the same time I feel like I don't know she also was a little bit like she tangled herself in a different story the one that now she needs to find out who did it and even though she might I think that's not the point at this point 47 years later if the guy is still alive or the person that killed her is still alive I mean, it's worth knowing. Remember the Golden State Killer? I mean, he looks like a sweet grandpa who <laughs> was a monster. So yeah, I get it. She wants justice. But it's just so sad to know that that's how things are, you know? And that 
If you don't know this information, you assume that if you report your daughter, your son, your father, your mother, your friend, if you report them missing, you just assume that when a body shows up, even if it's far away, that they will still check DNA to see if that person is somebody that they're looking for. I guess it's it happens. But just finding out two different cases where it didn't happen, where they did find a John Doe in another Jane Doe, and then they didn't think of looking into some... And I get it. I get it. They're busy. They have a lot of more things that they could be looking into instead of trying to find out Maybe somebody that was reported 20 years ago, 10 years ago, 5 years ago. But I think it's necessary if we want to give that. Because we can't give them the peace of knowing that they're okay. We can't do that. But if they're not with us anymore, living with that idea that they might come back that day. Or that they can be found. I think it's that's just horrible. And that something needs to be done to make that connection between missing people and some of these bodies that show up in different places. Listen, they're not going to do... I mean, if they're taken from, let's say, the Salt Lake City area and they show up in Salem, they should be a connection they should be. Because disappearing doesn't mean you're going to stick around. It means that they have no idea and you could be anywhere. So this was kind of a bittersweet case. And this was kind of a eye-opening case. To realize that there's a lot of people putting a lot of effort into finding connection between those Jane and John dolls and families that are hoping and praying that their family members will show up one day on their doorstep. It's like you can't win, you know? There's not a happy ending in this situation. You can't make you can't you can't make it go away. But you can do something about it. And I think that's a system that we have to find out or put in place in order for more people to do the best of they do the best that they can after losing somebody, either because they disappeared or they've been taken. I mean, just think about. There was this lady that said that every single day that she spends without her daughter, it's like a mini um, memorial service. Oh my goodness, I can't think about that. You can't even put my feet. I mean, in no her shoes for just a second, I can't. You go to a memorial service. I've been to a few. I am. Um, I go because I go. Because people deserve but I wish I didn't have to because it's just one of those things that I really feel like nobody wins but it's part of life and some of them they celebrate their lives and I think when they're older it kind of makes sense but I've been to memorial services for Younger people that shouldn't have died. So I can't, I can't imagine what it would be to go through your own quote-unquote funeral every single day that you have somebody, a loved one missing. Okay, you go through a funeral, you go through a memorial service once. It's sad, you had to go through it, but it's a day. It's a week. It was the month of. 
but think about it. Think about all those people that really feel like they're going through a memorial service every single day. It's just unbelievable. So, I think this case was worth sharing and I think it's as important as the other ones where we're looking for somebody. So, kind of opened my eyes too. Let me know what you think in the comments down below. I will start the podcast next Wednesday. I'll do separate cases compared to the ones that I share here during the week and I'm getting ready for that. So I hope that you join me back in the podcast that has been a little bit abandoned for a while now. But I'll, I hope that I see you around there next week when the new podcast season starts. So thanks for watching, guys. See you soon. Bye.